Hello, everybody. Um, I guess I don't have to say, let's wait a couple of moments to make sure everyone gets in. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm very happy to be hosting it. Uh, my name is Annabelle. I'm De Deputy Editor-in-Chief at European Wines Editorial Board. Um, before we start, let me remind you to turn off your microphones and cameras to make sure that this all goes smoothly. Uh, we apologize for the delay. There was some technical difficulties, but it happens in 2021. Um, so I'm very excited to be hosting this webinar. Today, our special guest will take us into, uh, will take us for a big dive into the universe of China's new generation, exploring the concept of brand natives through in-depth qualitative analysis of modern Chinese consumer behavior. I'm very pleased to welcome Marie Duval. Um, Marie has spent the majority of her life outside France, her home country, while in Asia. She worked in various multinational corporations as a marketeer, assisting brands to successfully penetrate and target unique and rapidly changing domestic environments and markets like that of China in the 2000s. She worked for brands like Cadbury, Lipton, Volvic, Danone, so much more. Um, with, this, with, with such strong and diversified experiences, she left the corporate world and joined independent market research firms, eventually creating her own qualitative market research and brand development consulting agency called Semopas. Um, in the second stage of her career, Marie relentlessly explored contemporary Chinese market trends and consumer behaviors, working on a wide range of concepts from high-end perfumes to mass market vegetables. Uh, having spent the past two decades witnessing modern changes, it is safe to say that she holds rich insight on today's modern China. Um, so after Marie's presentation, we will hold a Q&A session. Should you have any questions that you would like to ask, please write them to me in direct messages. Marie, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thanks to all of you. Um, so today, yeah, I would like to, together that we dive in into the, the mindset of the Chinese brand native. So um, now let's move on to the agenda very quickly. Yes, the, the next slide, please. Yes, yes. So um, I would like to, um, to share with you a four different chapter today. I will, I will, let's see if we can, uh, if I can share with you all of the slides. So first thing is I would like to uh, us to dive together into the brand native psychographic to understand who we are talking about and understand also uh, what they have been going through over the past three decades. And I will give you a little bit of insight about their, again, as I was saying, psychographic. In the second chapter, I would like to share with you the mega trends that are currently at work in Chinese society and all of the challenges that the brand natives in particular, because we're going to talk about them today, but actually the whole Chinese society is facing today. So, but again, our focus is on the brand native. I will just explain to you what I mean by brand natives. And I would like to share with you what they are currently experiencing, coping with, desiring and fear. And then uh, you will see brands have a particular role playing in the life of the brand native. So I would like also to share with you um, uh, how the brand and the brand native relationship is uh, is is uh, is uh, organizing. Then, if we have time, I would like to drive you through a few case study. Um, so for Semopass and then the previous uh, qualitative market research agency I've been working with. Um, um, we have been working on so many different categories, automobile, luxury, underwear, food, dairy, infant meal formula, luxury products. So I have picked up a few examples, few case study, and I would like to share with you. So in China, there is a definitely a, an amazing, booming, entertaining business around the theme parks. And I have been working on the on a new concept of steam park in Nanjing for Messi, for the soccer player Messi. Actually, the theme park didn't open, but we work on crafting the whole concept and proposition. So I would like to share with you a few insights about that. Beer and millennials, I'm not sure I will have time to drive you through this example, but I've been working for Abin, Abin Bev to design packages that would appeal to the brand natives, the Gen Z and the millennials. Then a very, very important uh, topic I would like to share with you is about the food and family bonds. You know how food is used and is um, at work within the family, creating sometimes a lot of tensions between generations. 
And then there is also another booming market, which is the perfume category for female, but for male also. And it's really uh, also very interesting insight about the perfume category to understand better the brand native. And then those brand natives, they are very important, uh, redefining the, the social norm in China and, and for the brands globally. So I would like to share with you, looking ahead, you know, thinking a little bit more about what will happen in the future and how important those Chinese brand natives are to reshape the, um, the social norm, but also how they are impacting the the, the brands and the brand global positioning. So let's move on to the next slide. And actually, uh, yeah, actually the next one. So now we are going to dive into the, the setting the scene. What, what, what is the framework for the Chinese brand native today? So let's move on to the next one. Yes, so, uh, in, so there is really something unique that has happened in, in China over the last 30 years is, uh, and, and that is uh, in the whole story of humanity since the beginning, such thing never, never took place. So between the 1980 and 90 until uh, to today, and it's uh, actually there is an ongoing acceleration, uh, China has entered a uh, well of society. So when I start working in China for the brand Cadbury in two, 2000, uh, actually, you know, the chocolate market, the chocolate category was, was almost zero. And when we were building our marketing activation plan for China, we were only considering around 100 million people in China that could afford to buy uh, quite, uh, you know, regular chocolate, which is a Cadbury, uh, Cadbury chocolate. So quite, uh, I mean, not cheap, but definitely not a luxury product. But at that time, it was considered a luxury. Right now, when I'm working on a FMCG product, you know, to launch a brand or to activate the brand in China, we are working on one billion, uh, one billion uh, target consumer. So, and this is only happened in 30 years. So, um, yeah. So. China has emerged to modernity, and this doesn't go without uh, tension uh, collectively, but also to the individual. So let's move on to the, the next slide. Yeah, so Den Xiaoping, you know, uh, after the, the catastrophe uh, and more than that, the, the drama that took place on Tiananmen, uh, it was a missed uh, opportunity for China to, to really evolve in a totally different type of society and governance. Den Xiaoping decided to uh, let loose China and to open China to the world. So I'm not going to go into the detail of uh, the different waves of entrepreneur in China, but actually there has been a different uh, generation of entrepreneur that have also shaped the whole Chinese economy. So some of them are extremely famous, like Jack Ma, you know, who created Alibaba, also Pony Ma, who created Tencent Company. But more recently, there is a new generation of ent entrepreneurs that are uh, definitely, you know, uh, uh, giving the impression to the whole Chinese society that in China today, everything and anything is possible. So there is generation, uh, the latest generation of uh, entrepreneurs have created company like Xiaomi, who is now embarking on the electric uh, car uh, category. Uh, another one you're not so familiar for GD.com, but it's a, it's a e-commerce platform that is extremely successful from pro producer directly to the consumer. Mobike was an amazing example created by a very uh, talented uh, young Chinese woman, Hu Weiwei, and, and there is a, another company. So really this generation of entrepreneurs and, and the different waves have also shaped the whole impression for the whole Chinese society that uh, uh, no matter what you want, you know, there is opportunity to get it. So. This is, a, in a way, extremely optimistic and, and uh, let give the impression to the brand native that they can make it and they can achieve it as well. So let's move on to the next slide. So also what has happened, uh, I was explaining again uh, more on the, on the time frame, what has happened over the last 30 years, but what has ha happened in terms of uh, the way the Chinese people live their life is uh, we have also seen a rising middle class. So I was giving you this example of only targeting 100 million people and today is 1 billion in only 20 years. 
the booming digitalization and and uh, you know what's happening in China is also China in terms of uh, the the social e-commerce system they have created. They have they are. I will give you a few slides just to explain very briefly. But this is something that is very unique to China that can only be possible in China because China is actually a closed uh, a closed system and they are totally uh, not totally but almost disconnected from the the big um, the, the big internet uh, uh, worldwide network they have they are really creating something that is working in autonomy and then you know there is much more security for the money transaction via wechat etc is super controlled of course but it's also quite secure so disruptive urbanization i mean this goes without saying that uh, for the people who have, who have had a chance to travel or live in china over the last 20 years you know you just don't recognize the the city you you have been uh, you have been familiar with i remember interviewing a, a young chinese guy who was living in in uh, shanghai but he was originally from xian and he was telling me you know he grew up in xian and he had his uh, his child bedroom and he has been quite bored as a child as many uh, uh, Chinese uh, kids from the single single child generation so he has been looking through his window uh, at a mountain that he, he had an overview of from his uh, bedroom and one day for Chinese New Year he returned to his uh, hometown to visit his parents and grandparents and have all of the Chinese New Year celebration and he looked through the window and the mountain had disappeared so how many people in the world can say you know there was a mountain here and after two years I come back to my hometown or maybe three years and the mountain has disappeared so this is definitely has a, an amazing impact on, on the mindset and also the level of anxiety that Chinese people might have. Hypermobility. So also us, you know, we have been traveling really extensively in China and in Asia over the last 30 years. But uh, I remember also the green train, you know, that we're moving in the night at 30, 35 kilometers per hour. And uh, recently we went to, um, we, we came back from Shanghai to, to Europe by train and we crossed China. Uh, so this is a few thousand kilometers in, in only uh, 36 hours with a super fast uh, train. But, and, and this is a, a view of a, a China, uh, um, you know, the, the elevated highway in, in Shanghai that I show on this picture. So the hypermobility is not only physical and geographic, but is also for the, uh, for the, for the working people. You know, people are moving from a third tier city to higher tier city. And that, uh, that uh, means that they really have to change the, the, the type of lifestyle and they have to adapt to totally different types of uh, uh, city, urban, and peer environment. Okay, so let's move on to the, the next slide. So brand native, when, when I, I talk about brand native, uh, I would like to give you a bit more insight about in terms of uh, psychodemographic about who they are. So actually with brand native is all of the people that were born uh, after the post 80 uh, generation. So they all belong to the single child uh, family which also has a, a major impact also on the, on the, the type of uh, psychology you have, on the way you, you, you can relate to others huh? because uh, you don't have siblings no, lo no longer in China. I mean, it's starting again because the single child policy is, uh, is losing, losing up right now in China without the effect that the Chinese government was expecting. Uh, but anyway, when you grow up in a single child family and you are the focus of not only two parents, but four grandparents, and you have, you know, the future of the family, you are the one that will help the family continue to grow and, and, uh, and develop, you know, that's really create, create a, a very specific mindset. So for the brand native, we include uh, what we call the Generation Z. So those are the people, they are very me-centered and they are 13 to 17 years old. So they are really, uh, they actually, they, are, they, are, they have quite a lot of uh, material comfort. You know, they, they, they also, they get the money from, uh, again, four grandparents and the parents. And the parents, they have benefited from the, the um, uh, uh, urbanization with the, uh, they, they really benefit from the, this new prosperity society. So they, they are quite, uh, uh, they have quite of a purchase power, this Generation Z. 
And uh, then, you know, we include in the brand native, the young millennials. So they are 18 to 24. So most of them are college or university students or yeah, yeah. And those people are already, you know, uh, starting to think about the future. So, and, and, and also they are in an extremely intense uh, um, academic competition. So uh, they are really focused on the study, but they have a limited uh, space to, um, to, to express their freedom and to start developing out of the family control who they are as individual. And then we also include the older millennials. So those are the young professional they start entering the, the workforce, they are active. And here, you know, they, they start also having more money to afford, uh, to afford to purchase brand and to really start crafting their lifestyle. So those, they are 25 to 35 years old. And they also start integrating social consideration. They are chasing for job, for uh, partner. Uh, women start thinking about uh, it's time to, to get married. You know, in China, when you, you, you are 30, is already too old and to get married. And I will share with you a few campaigns about uh, marriage. And that's a very intense pressure on, on Chinese young women. So Gen Z, ultra connected, very agile, volatile, and they behave as a as herd. They really be, the the dynamic around uh, for them is uh, to behave as a herd. They are quite also easily in a way manipulated or influenced by by everything they see happening on the social network. The young millennials, they are really here to enjoy the moment. It's the first time in their life they're. They have a, a freedom, limited freedom, as we will see, but they are not under the control of the parents and grandparents and, and, and at home, family life. So that's a quite exciting time for young Chinese people. And then the older millennial, they, they start to demonstrate social edge and they start to live the, an aspirational life that they, they, are, they have been dreaming of and that they see uh, uh, expressed again in the social media. So uh, yes, so already you are in the in the what I call the lollipop of generation. So on this slide, I wanted to share with you the the hierarchy, uh, influence and the influencing power across generation when it comes to purchasing brands and items and even apartments and cars. So there is really um, a different. Uh, the hierarchy is exactly the way I, I picture it. So the fourth generation. So the, the Gen Z, yeah, they are the, the focus of the family. So they are extremely important when it comes to, to purchasing food, automobile, apartment, brands, TV sets, uh, clothes, etc. So they, they are really the, the most influential when we talk about uh, brand power. The second generation is the, the young and older millennials and, and also the, the young families. So the third generation, they, they are the one also absorbing uh, extremely high tensions because they are the one creating Chinese modernity. And they, they really have uh, various attitudes depending on when they are living their life outside and at work and when they are living their life inside the home and inside the family circle. Uh, this in particular for the women, you know, women, they are almost like uh, schizophrenic in China. Uh, in home, they have to behave as the perfect mother, perfect uh, uh, daughter-in-law, a perfect wife. And outside, they, they are the women from the single uh, uh, child generation. So they tend to be a, little, a bit more foolish, you know, and, and really uh, um, uh, more uh, extrovert outside and going out with their peer friends. And so the, the pressure on Chinese women, again, is very important and that, that, uh, that drives them to become, as I was saying, a bit schizophrenic. So the, the first generation, so, you know, Chinese people live quite old and they have had a, a life diet that was very healthy. They were very frugal in the way they were eating and not drinking too much alcohol, and also, you know, uh, very important to uh, to go for a, um, a sports practice in the park and uh, all of that. So they, they live quite old. So the first generation, they have a symbolic power. But uh, in China, of course, the, we live in a Confucianist society. So respect the older is very important. And uh, uh, also many things will happen within the family circle to show respect and to, to show the care for the, the, older, the oldest generation.
The second generation is the people who were 50 to 60. So they are actually the, the generation that has been sacrificed by what uh, by this uh, emergence of China within the, the little uh, prosperity era. They, they really suffered from what has happened during cultural revolution, during their childhood. And they have been the one really uh, struggling and working hard without having a lot of money. They invested into apartments when they could, and they have, a sh they have transmitted those, these wealth to the next generation, but themselves, you know, they, they, they have now to take care of the, the children, sometimes grandchildren, when the active generation is at work and commuting and, and working long hours. They have to take care of their old parents because in China, there is no such things as a retirement home. They, the, 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 the old people, the grandparents are kept within the family. So they are really the one uh, maintaining the whole family harmony, but they didn't really uh, rip the, the harvest from, from everything that has happened in China over the last 30 years. So let's move on very quickly, you know, uh, and, and we have uh, in China, when we work in brand activation and marketing, we, I mean, it takes uh, almost 60% of our time to understand how the, 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 this amazing social ecom system is evolving because every day you have new celebrities, new live streaming, new uh, new ecom platform. So the digitalization has impacted the Chinese daily life. And uh, so I won't go uh, into everything that is happening every second, 60 seconds in China, but but this um, this digital world in China is, is something even in Europe, even for all of you, uh, most of you that are also digital native, you, you are, we are not there yet in China. In China, it, it's really amazing. So let's move on to the, the, the next slide, which is, uh, a little bit, uh, yeah, can you move on to the next slide, please? Yes, so this one is quite frightening, but in China, there is a, what we call the BAT system. So it's a Baidu, Tencent and Alibaba. And you see how, uh, so all of those uh, amazing uh, digital monster, they have created e-commerce platform, they have created social platform. And over the past five years, actually, which is, uh, I think, not yet happening in Europe or other Western market, uh, social and e-commerce are now becoming integrated. And even between the, the three big digital monster, you can see there is uh, interaction and interconnection. So again, this digital world is, 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 um, is, a, is a frantic, is vibrant, is fast evolving. And, um, and it is amazing. And as brand and brand natives, of course, that's the world they live in. Huh? So let's move on to the next one. Yes, so China uh, loves shopping online. and. Uh, uh, it already uh, back in 2013, you know, China uh, uh, has uh, overcome USA in terms of uh, digital uh, digital e-com transaction. But now, you know, in some categories, for instance, a beauty cosmetic, uh, more than 60% of the, the retail uh, transaction are made online. And the COVID pandemic in China, you know, we, we have been, I was in China during the the COVID uh, pandemic when it, when, it, uh, when it started in, in Wuhan, then in Shanghai in February. So we were locked down in our home and actually already the, um, the e-com transaction were, were very high for some category. The, the key market, the key uh, channel was uh, e-commerce, but now it's even more the case. Huh? So, uh, and, and uh, at that time, I remember I was working a lot in food. And at that time, you know, Chinese people, they, are, they have also, we will see that also in a second. They have gone through, through so many food scandal over the past uh, two decades. They were very cautious about the food, you know, and they, for, for food, they really uh, wanted to go into the supermarket, the fresh market to really uh, taste and feel and, and touch the, the meat, the vegetables, the fish. But now even in those uh, fresh food item, uh, online has, has become uh, one of the major channel. So this is also an amazing, um, 
an, an amazing phenomenon that is impacting the way uh, China live their life and, and how they could uh, uh, totally organize their life at home. I also remember um, talking uh, during an ethno interview to a young Chinese person, and uh, that person was telling me over the last uh, months, he, he didn't uh, leave his home. He stayed in his home and he could do everything in his home. You know, he could, uh, uh, he was gaming online, he was uh, uh, delivering meals by all of the e-commerce platform and the amazing uh, uh, delivery network system in China, which we could argue, you know, they are really also creating a, a, a really um, almost slave category of worker, which are the, the delivery men and women uh, all over the, the big cities in China. So delivering food, gaming, uh, ordering, uh, ordering items, uh, chatting with friends, uh, etc. And he was also doing a lot of uh, following a lot of tutorial you know to develop his skills about cooking and and wine for instance so one month he didn't uh, physically leave the home okay let's move on to the the next slide i just wanted to give you an example uh, okay in china it's very easy to impress with numbers huh? but there is in china also a new phenomenon in a phenomenon in this digital world is the combination of the celebrities and live streaming live streaming uh, it has become, has become extremely popular and you have uh, KOL and live streamers that could promote uh, in a very humoristic way, very funny way, very entertaining way, um, fan bien mien, uh, the, the, the fast uh, convenient noodle. So this is an example of this, um, of, of this uh, very popular blogger. Her name is Becky Lee and she's a, a cute young uh, Chinese uh, Chinese girl, and she was uh, organizing this program. And in four minutes, you know, she sold 100 mini. And I think the price of each uh, mini Cooper was around 50,000 US dollar. So in just four minutes, you know, she, she, she's not so famous. I mean, she's just a, a popular fashion blogger, but uh, she, she was so powerful, you know, and, and that has never happened for the brand uh, in any time of its history to sell a 100, uh, limited seri mini in, in only four minutes. So this is just one example, but there is another very famous blogger, I forgot his name, he's a man, and he's promoting the lipstick yeah, and is really only focusing on, on lipstick. And uh, he was invited um, by the brand Hermes. You know, Hermes has made uh, recently an entrance into the makeup market and they, they, were, they were preparing the launch of their uh, lipstick uh, Hermes in China, and they contacted uh, as a, uh, like before the launch in China, this very famous uh, male blogger, and he had the chance, you know, to be invited to a, uh, ah, yeah, thanks, uh, his name is Li Jiaqi, so he was invited by the brand Hermes, you know, to be one of the first uh, VIP in the world to see the, the packaging and to test the color of the Hermes uh, product. And actually, uh, one year or one year and a half before the, the lipstick Hermes were launched in China, he created quite bad buzz and he, he gave uh, bad comments about those lipsticks. So uh, I, I, we might have somebody from Hermes listening to this webinar today. So I don't know whether she's familiar with that story, but I guess for Hermes, it was uh, quite different difficult you know one year before the launch to to have such uh, already such negative comments from a, such a powerful uh, uh, blogger in china so let's move on to the next one the next slide so now we are going to dive a little bit uh, deeper into uh, the mindset of those chinese brand natives uh, so their overall attitude in life so here i uh, this is actually from a collage huh? Uh, sometimes in the focus group we run or during the ethno interview, we ask uh, Chinese people, you know, sometimes they have a hard time to express the feeling that they have deep down inside. This is changing uh, with the brand native, but we, we often use the collage technique. So give, we give them magazine and, and post it and they can write the words and they can cut the picture they want. So here, um, this is a combination of different pictures and words that uh, a few of brand native have, uh, have developed during a focus group when we were kind of in a warm up uh, uh, part of the discussion with them. And we were asking them, you know, what are your key values in life? What, 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 is, what do you spend the most time thinking or considering or what are your feelings? So this is just a combination. So 
uh, there are, and, and I'm not saying that Chinese brand native are different from any uh, digital native around the world, but they have some characteristics that are, are quite particular. So uh, in a way, the, the, what is making Ch uh, Chinese digital brand native different from maybe other brand native in the world, or especially from different generation, is um, actually they now, and the younger they are, the, the stronger this, uh, this desire is, they really want to uh, develop a, a more what they call meaningful individuality. They want to be able to create better and more sincere uh, bonds between themselves and the other surrounding. Uh, the, the Hermes uh, person is answering me, but the, the WeChat comment is gone. So you will have to repeat later to explain uh, how Hermes overcome that uh, bad buzz uh, from this um, male uh, lipstick blogger. So the, the younger they are, you know, the more uh, idealistic they are, the older they are, um, the, the more they want to live, I mean, they, they feel the reality, the stress, you know, living in today's Chinese society is so intense. They want to escape and find a, a, a world of fantasy. Uh, in terms of identity, the younger brand native are, the more um, me, the more me oriented they are. The older they are, they, are, they would like to, they, they really want to behave and, and be integrated within their peer group, but they would like to rule that peer group. They want to bring something to the group. They want to show up, they want to stand out, but within, um, within the peer, uh, within their peer group and their, could, the peer group could be their friends the, and the, very often is the colleague from work. Huh? The, the, the work, you know, in China, this is the heritage also from the Dan Wei. You know, the Dan Wei was your working unit where everything would happen. You would get the apartment, you would get the wife, uh, you would get, get the, you would go to the canteen, you would have the school for the children. So there is an heritage in China from the Dan Wei and what's happening at work with your colleagues is very important. And uh, very often the, the boundaries between uh, uh, work and, and your private life is very blurred compared to Europe. Uh, very often, you know, they go for uh, drinks after work and they, they go to the karaoke together and, and sometimes they share more with the colleague than, than with their family or, or if they have cousin, etc. So for release, you know, the younger those brand native are, the more they are into, uh, they want to be light, you know, they, they don't want to, uh, to live a heavy life and to be bothered with the, the family and social constraint. Um, in terms of bounding, um, for, the, for the younger, they really want, they are into an explore type of attitude. They want to discover, they want to learn from other culture, from other region, from other, uh, from other people having other fashion and taste and, and food, uh, food passion or other like hobbies like photographies or sports or tango, etc. Uh, the older they are, the more they are into consolidating their social position. So let's move on to this, the next slide. I have many slides I want to share with you. So I don't want to be too talkative on each slide. So this is another collage. Uh, I hear again in an ethno interview, I was interviewing a young female journalist, so she was 27 years old, and I asked her to describe um, the, the, the day in her life in a weekday, yeah? and also to associate emotion with that. So what we realized, and this is only one of them, but actually most of the collage that I collected were quite similar. What we understand is they live a very busy life, and, and they... they quite afraid of uh, void and emptiness. So they, they really have always something to do, again, with the mobile when they're commuting or at home. Uh, they, so they have very intense uh, daily days because also they commute, you know, it's not uh, very um, unfrequent in China that you, you will take a one hour, 30 minutes, even two hours to go to work. Um, so they, they, they have very long days, hard, uh, hard working days, very busy, but they are quite bored most of the time. Huh? So here, you know, they, they decided to, to use those emoticons. So you see in the in a very busy day, actually they are they only have two times when they feel quite happy and, 
and satisfied with what they are doing. And most of the time, it's not what's going on, well, it's going on at work. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, so entertainment uh, is, is extremely important. Also, you have to remember that compared to, uh, uh, to the digital native or to the Gen Z or the millennials living in Western society or democracy, there are a lot of playgrounds in China for, for young generation that are not allowed or that are super controlled. So they cannot, for instance, you know, the, the, the music scene is controlled, you know, the, the singer cannot, uh, cannot have all of the lyrics they want. Uh, they cannot go and, and, and organize street protests. They cannot go into political activism. The religion of freedom is not tolerated, you know, now in China, and this has happened over the last five years, um, they have, for instance, in the Catholic Church, uh, there are cameras and the, the people, I think it's under uh, 18s, they are not allowed to go uh, into the, the church and uh, the speech that the, the priest would uh, share with the, the, the people coming uh, into the church, you know, they, 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 are, they are censored as well, they have to be controlled. So the, the, the space to really uh, develop who you are, to experience, to share, to debate are quite limited. There is one space that is actually totally open and is the consumerism. So hence, you know, I think consumerism has become some, something extremely important because, um, uh, uh, Annabelle is making a comment. So, so the, um, the place, you know, where you can really develop your own personality, try out new style, new outfit, uh, uh, discover new things, uh, uh, get new skills is that where the where all of that is happening is are the shopping malls is also when you go out traveling is also on the this, uh, this very uh, amazing uh, social e commerce world. Uh, so that's really where the, the whole life of a Chinese uh, brand native is taking place. That's really where they can, they can become who they, want to, who they want to become. So let's move on to the next one. So also, you know, and, and I've been working not only in Asia, but also in, uh, in Western countries, but never have I heard from uh, the people, the respondents I was interviewing that brands, uh, can be considered as uh, my life buddy. And those are here, I'm putting some verbatim. So verbatim, you know, this is the, the base of the, the material and the corpus we analyze when we do qualitative market research. So I, I'm just going to quote two of them. So one of them in Guangzhou was telling me, you know, brands for me, they are like my role models. I learned from a brand, a brand is for me my mentor. And another one was a little bit older in Shanghai was telling me the brand is like a supervisor at work. Will help me, you know, to will help me things, will show me the way. So also um, the, the brands, you know, evolve with the different life stage. So here we were doing a, a project on fast fashion and we were trying to understand the repertoire of brands that the young millennials and the older millennials were using. So you see also the brands, they are uptrading the brand as they are uptrading themselves and becoming more well off uh, in terms of uh, revenue and also in terms of knowledge and position within the company or within the society. So brands really accompany brand natives and that's also why we call them a brand native. So brands also work as badge value. If I can afford to have a, a Hermes or Louis Vuitton bag, you know, I'm, I'm really successful and I can showcase my success to the rest of my family and my peers. If I bring the latest niche perfume that I would have purchased in Japan, Korea or France when I was traveling, I will also uh, uh, share that I have knowledge and knowledge in China, we are in a Confucianist society is power. So let's move on to the next one. So brand natives are extremely important globally. And uh, you, you have also probably followed the recent uh, Xinjian cotton uh, scandal that are putting uh, many uh, brands at stake in China, H&M, Adidas, uh, uh, there was uh, Nike and, and many others, Burberry and many others will follow. So uh, this was uh, this uh, uh, Xinjiang cotton scandal was instrumentalized by the the, the League of the Young uh, Communist uh, the League of the Young Communist uh, 
in China. But it really showed that now, you know, um, the Chinese government and uh, is using the brand native as, a, as a, a strong power to influence also the, the politic and, and brands. Now uh, they cannot have a voice as uh, many others cannot have a voice in China. So brand native, they have taken control. They are now extremely mature, demanding, and they are creating a relationship with brand, which is no longer into a, a top down. Now they are, uh, they, are, they, they are expecting and they want to be respected and they want you know, to have a word and they want also to be considered. And so this is also really changing the, the game that uh, and the way brands are going to talk to the Chinese audience in the, in the coming years. So let's move on to the, the media trends that are shaping. Oh, can you move on to the next slide, please? So I would like to share with you uh, what we call the mega trends that are shaping Chinese society today and also impacting very strongly the brand native. So brand native, they are very keen. Oh, maybe let's move on to the next one because I've put some pictures. So that will be uh, that will be more interesting. So brand native, extremely curious. They want to experience. They want to live and discover for themselves and by themselves. So of course, right now with the pandemic, you know, traveling abroad is uh, no longer an option, but um, traveling uh, uh, abroad for Chinese people and the young generation was something like extremely exciting. And, uh, and um, first, you know, they would go to uh, uh, close by countries, like of course, Taiwan and then Japan, and then for exotic vacation to Thailand, Cambodia. But if you know they had a chance to go to the US and, and especially to Europe, you know that would be a, a, a thrilling experience. They are also, um, they want to enjoy the moment now. So they are really into indulgence. And we see that uh, Shanghai now is, is a city in the world where there is the most, uh, the, the highest number of coffee shop. Huh? And, and again, remember I was working on Lipton for a few years and China is a tea culture. So, and, and I think I, I remember working for Lipton like 15 or 10 years ago. We could not imagine that uh, all of a sudden uh, those uh, coffee shop and bakery would mushroom all over the city as they have mushroomed in, in Shanghai. So let's move on to the next slide. So the evolution of individuality. So as I was telling, uh, sharing with you already, the younger the brand native are, especially the Gen Z, the more they want to be considered as a, as a very unique and specific individual. But actually Chinese people, when you talk to them individually and when they have a chance to express individually, you know, how, how strong they feel, how confident they feel, they actually feel individually and personally quite fragile. But what they know is collectively, they are extremely strong. So the importance of we in China is always, and this has no common sense with what's happening in, in the Western society. So this, this kind of dilemma and tension between, I want to become me, but I want to become me with the, the, the security and the comfort of the, of the we and collective network is, is always very important when you deal with them. Let's move on to the next slide. So also, and, and this is something we have been working on for all of the brands uh, have been uh, accompanying over the last few years is, uh, uh, and I remember I did a project for Pernod Ricard, we were trying to create a, a, new, brand, a new brand of uh, a Chinese spirits that would fit the young generation. You know, we're a little bit fed up with the uh, Baijiu, very strong, uh, traditional, and, and actually quite disgusting, even for them, uh, alcohol. Um, and beer, which is also uh, considered as a cheap beverage and as a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, uh, features and characteristics that are not so comfortable uh, after uh, being drinking too much beer. So we are trying to, to work on a, a new modern Chinese alcohol. And we have been really working on what could be Chinese modernity. So I was asking my respondents, you know, to associate a modern brand with Chinese brand. And so we have three uh, space. They were supposed to, to uh, give me uh, old fashioned brands. They were supposed to give me very modern brand. And then I asked them to, to give me modern Chinese brand. 
And that was again, uh, maybe seven, uh, seven, eight years ago, but the space where they were supposed to uh, key in Chinese modern brand was empty. So for them, again, that was seven years ago. Huh? So shaping Chinese modernity is really a, a big challenge and is something that is now happening over the last two, three years. And this is just amazing to see Chinese modernity emerging uh, within the brand, uh, but not only brand and art and design, huh? but this is a really, really recent phenomenon. So here you see some furniture uh, again, the lady from Hermes will recognize it's a, is a furniture, a wooden furniture from the brand Shangxia. And it's a, the, the design inspiration is from the, the, the furniture, which are amazingly beautiful and uh, elegant from the Ming dynasty, but in a modern version. That was, I remember when I was asking all of my respondents, give me an example of a, a very Chinese elegant modernity design. And one of them, could afford you know, to visit the Shangxia Hermes store, but quoted me that brand. So that's why I was uh, sharing you that image. So let's move on to the next slide. So also oh, oh, something they are, uh, which is also uh, quite complicated is, uh, and this is also used a lot by the government, you know, to unify the whole society. They, they uh, Chinese in, 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 the, in the official, I mean, in the media, meaning official media, they keep, you know, uh, sharing the idea that uh, China has been humiliated by Western nation because they missed the industrial revolution end of the 19th century by the Japanese, you know, and, and, and what has happened during the Second World War by, by the, the war of opium. So they really, um, the whole idea that is really also uh, deep down uh, impacting the, 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 the Chinese uh, um, psychology is uh, us as a nation, as a people, we have been humiliated. So right now, you know, over the last uh, past few years, I'm sharing you the example of uh, Lu Xiang, who was, uh, I think, one of the first uh, athletes uh, to win a gold medal. Uh, then they had the world exhibition in Shanghai, and they created the, this uh, red uh, pavilion. And actually, they created for that uh, world exhibition in Shanghai a color. They call it the, the China red. And this is the color of the Chinese flag. And this is the color of this uh, pavilion that was a Chinese pavilion during the world exhibition. Recently, you know, they have been sending a, a, a taikonaut, uh, no, astronauts into the, into the space. So all of that is making the, the, the headlines in the press and collectively, you know, they, they know they can accomplish uh, great things and there is no limit huh, uh, for Chinese society, people and technology in the future. Let's move on to the next one. So, uh, uh, but also there, what what they as a what they have to, what the challenge they have to uh, to to do is uh, how to maintain the tradition. And again, talking to a, a young Chinese person, you know, with with Japan, there is a lot of tension, jealousy, and opposition. But um, that young engineer uh, was telling me, you know, that uh, Japanese people could be quite proud because for him uh, in Asia, and he was also mentioning Korea to a lesser extent, but for him, uh, China, uh, Japan was uh, best in class. Uh, Japan for him was um, a country, a society, a culture that could evolve into modernity, but stick to the, to the tradition and the uh, and, uh, and he was also amazed, uh, uh, like he was strolling uh, one of the, the area of uh, Tokyo, Ginza, and he, he could see the kind of the, the skyscraper and all of the, the huge uh, video screens, but then he crossed, uh, he crossed the geisha. And he was amazed by how this could work in Japan, the, the, the mixing and combination of uh, modernity and tradition. And he was worried at that time when I interviewed him that China would not be able to integrate and mingle the tradition with the modernity. So China is a Confucianist society. So affiliation, transmission, respect, there is a natural hierarchical order. You respect the older is, is something, you know, they have all, they all grew up with and the, the education system in China is extremely harsh. 
but education is also something that is at the at stake and at heart of the what this uh, generation of brand native will do they don't want to educate the children the way they have been educated because it's too harsh it's too stressful it's too painful and it doesn't help to develop your individuality and and uh, and to develop yourself as a balance and a uh, and quite uh, at ease type of uh, person. So this is a very, very big challenge I come across uh, no matter which uh, project I'm working on. So let's move on to the next one. So shareability, you know, we have seen that the social e-com uh, world in China is just at the, at the heart of the everyday life of brand native, but um, to, to exist, you know, to, to make an impression, to, uh, to, to be able to, yeah, to live also and, and to behave, to behave in a way that is recognized by your peers on, on the social e-com, you have to be able to share, uh, to showcase your lifestyle, a little bit uh, idealized lifestyle, and it has to be uh, with an extremely high aesthetic. So now you know what's happening in Shanghai, all of the exhi art exhibition, or uh, you have photo booths, you have a uh, uh, always happenings and it's always uh, very me centered so that's also maybe becoming also in western culture but this is again coming to an extreme in China so shareability and the level of aesthetic that is uh, requested is very high in China and this is a challenge okay let's move on to the next one uh, okay, so I was uh, previously more talking about the positive aspect of uh, Chinese society evolving into modernity. Now I'm going to deep dive a little bit more into the individual level and all of the more negative impact it created on the at the individual level. So let's move on to the next slide. So um, and and maybe the the slides I'm going to share with you might be a little bit pessimistic. And I would say, uh, uh, I mean, I, I was uh, uh, considering and checking some slides from uh, an analysis I've been uh, working with, with a, a young Taiwanese girl, a young Taiwanese analyst, but she has lived a long time in China. But I think maybe her Taiwanese uh, uh, brain might have impacted the way she was uh, considering what was happening in, in China nowadays. So it might be a little bit too pessimistic, but still, you know, this is something when we have a chance during the, the qualitative analysis that I run to talk one-on-one uh, -on -one with our brand native respondents, we come very often when they, they feel comfortable and when they're really uh, ready to open their heart, we fall into all of those more negative considerations at individual level. So they are definitely, you know, they have seen the world uh, totally being reshaped around them. Huh? Um, the, the city of, Sh uh, not Shanghai necessarily, but uh, all of the tier two city and, and Beijing is, a, I mean, it's a quite a, a catastrophe when, when you understand what has happened in, in Beijing with the total uh, new urbanization, what Beijing was before the Olympic Games and what it is today. It's really a city where as a, as a human being, as an individual, you, you feel like a, a micro, micro uh, little things lost in a, in a big uh, urban uh, gray city. So they have the sense of uh, disorientation and uh, where do I belong? You know, where do I come from? Uh, where do I belong? Where is my comfort zone? Social competition is, is uh, extremely fierce. So, you know, uh, not only you have to fight, but from very young age to get into the, the best, uh, the school and high school and, and university and then the job, you know, every, every year in China, there are 8 million uh, uh, graduate students that come to the, the workforce and the economy is slowing down. And before, you know, as I was saying, you know, the done way of your parents were providing you a job. Now it's free market and you have to you have to go and fight with all of the others to get the job. For the women on top of that, that you know, there is a extremely high pressure, which is part of the social competition on the on the beauty. You have to keep your perfect skin, perfect beauty, perfect body, uh, uh, keep always very fit to be able to find the right job and the right husband and then be promoted. And the, the beauty factor 
and the uh, criteria for women is, is something they keep fighting with. Uh, and so I was working a lot in food uh, uh, category and, and uh, what they do in terms of diet, Chinese girls is sometimes uh, really crazy, but they, they are also overwhelmed by the beauty standards that they get from the social, uh, uh, social world. So wealth inequality, you, are, you might have heard about the Gini index is actually uh, for a communist country, you know, this little prosperity overall, has helped um, 200 million people, you know, to, to get out of poverty. But when you look at the inequality rate in China is extremely high. Uh, and then uh, housing is a, is a very important thing also. Uh, and initially I wanted to share with you a, a big project we have done in a, a ethnographic project on home space in China. I won't have time to share it to, today with you, but the housing is, is something also that is a, uh, quite worrying for the young generation who didn't have the chance to have their parents from a tier one or tier two city. Huh? The, the young the brand native coming from a tier three cities have been studying and working in tier one, tier two cities. You know, they, they are really confronted with a, how can I afford a, a decent house? And sometimes they have to go very far away in the suburbs, you know, to have a to have a, a house that is a, a, aligned with the, the today's lifestyle standard that they are desiring. Okay, let's move on. So there is also a lot of um, uh, chaos and fragmentation when they talk about this. So de definitely they are bombarded with a, a brand, you know, activation, but there is also an amazing um, proliferation of materialistic choice. And also remember over the last two decades, the brands uh, from all over the world have been fighting to to, to get um, a, a slice of the pie of this amazing purchase power of Chinese consumer. So it's a very complex uh, uh, brand repertoire that they have to deal with huh? because uh, in cosmetic, in luxury, in automobile, for instance, we are in Europe, you know, uh, we, we, uh, we tend to be very familiar with European automobile brand. But in China, you have brands from US, Korea, Japan, China, uh, uh, India, you know, and, and the, the, the complexity of the brand world is, is you have to deal and juggle with it. Fragmented time, because when you know you are, you belong to the Gen Z or millennial generation, the, the gap with your parents and grandparents is not only one or two generation, it could be up to six generation especially if your grandparents you know come come and live in the tier 3 tier 4 city they might still be living in a in a very uh, in a little rural village and all of a sudden you know you you come to the you, you have made a, a move into almost one one century uh, ahead in time and you come you come to shanghai so uh, commuting between your hometown with your parents grandparents and a tier 1 city when you have you have been moving like that uh, it is quite complicated to to deal with uh, in terms of uh, what you have to go through and what you have to integrate so the environmental disorder, you know, uh, again, working a lot in the food category, I remember a quote from uh, one consumer, but actually many of them, we were working on imported ham from France, and uh, I was asking them, you know, but uh, at that time the brand was considering whether they would import the, the, the pigs in, in uh, China and then uh, uh, slice them in China or whether we, we would import the ham uh, directly packed from France. And I remember the answer from a Chinese respondent. He was telling me, you know, in China, the air, the earth, and the waters all are polluted. So when we eat food, we want to make sure the pig, you know, the way they, they grew up, the way they were fed, what they were eating, the way they were, they were killed and sliced, we, we really, really need to be comf comfortable and confident with the whole chain. So they, they understand, you know, that what, what has come up with modernity is also a lot of uh, uh, disruption and uh, catastrophe for the environment. They are really uh, extremely aware of that. So let's move on to the next one. So uh, this is a little bit to summarize, you know, as an individual, you, you live the conflict between generations. You have seen the world around you disintegrated and the urban landscape being totally reshaped. 
you understand, you know, when you are out of your home and when you start going outside and, and going out with your friends or uh, at work, you know, so social competition is extremely harsh. So you have to uh, showcase and put on a mask. That's also very often an expression that the respondent would tell me that when they, as soon as they go out of the, uh, their home, they put a mask. They have to be smiley. They have to pretend they are super confident, powerful, effective, beautiful, etc. So, uh, but deep down inside, they feel quite fragile and, and a little bit lost about uh, uh, what is this Chinese modernity and, and how can I feel comfortable? How can I find my new comfort zone in, in this ever changing uh, life around me? So, let's move on to the next one. So, Annabelle, can you tell me? Um, uh, if yes. I'm talking too much. Um, unfortunately, we have to stop here because we're running out of time, but this has been uh, quite comprehensive. Um, thank can, you. Can thank I you just so have much a for the presentation. Okay, no yeah. time for the reshaping the model because no, okay. Uh, unfortunately, we have to stop here, but as okay. some of you may have seen, there was double the amount of information that was already provided. Um, this turned more into a masterclass than a presentation, but we're so grateful for so much insight. Um, so let's move on to the Q&A session. Um, I will inaugurate the Q&A with the very first question. Um, could you perhaps discuss a bit more about the relationship between consumption and consumer behavior and freedom in China? Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, we, we discussed that with Annabelle when we were preparing. Uh, so um, yeah, what I was saying is, uh, I think in, in the life of uh, all of the human beings, you know, once you get out of your family circle, you start uh, developing and experiencing a lot to decide uh, exactly where you stand, where you fit, when you, when you are going to be the best of yourself. But as I was saying, you know, in China, the, the freedom spaces are quite limited. Huh? You on, on, the, on TV, on, on the WeChat, on the, on the, in the newspaper, I mean, you don't have so much choice. There is only one single type of, uh, of speech, let's say propaganda. Even, you know, your own history. I remember asking also, uh, I was doing a project uh, on the 4th of May. I was uh, doing ethnographic interview at home with a young respondents. And I was asking them, oh, by the way, you know, today is 4th of May. Uh, does it ring a bell? What has happened in China over the last decades, etc." And uh, uh, nobody told me uh, Tiananmen Square. One of them was very interesting, told me, oh, that's the, the death of the Ayatollah Khomeini. So, okay, the guy was quite uh, educated, I guess. But uh, so, so they don't even know what has happened in their, the rev cultural revolution black box. Nobody talks about it. So the playground they have is uh, also in the city, you know, the, the climate and the, is not so easy in city like Shanghai, even Beijing, it's too hot or too typhoon or mosquito or whatever. So uh, they, they, they like to go to the shopping mall because the shopping mall, that's where uh, you, you can experience everything. In shopping mall, you have karaoke, you have cinema, you have a food corner, you have a, a fashion show, you have an art exhibition, uh, you, you have shops, of course, you have gym, you have dentists, you have schools, you have... A, so really the place where they can experience and try and are the shopping mall. So the, the freedom playgrounds for brand natives, I mean, I'm making that a little bit uh, simplistic, but I think it's the shopping mall and it's consumerism. And they, they were, I also remember doing a fast fashion project and um, the, the people uh, in, in other uh, society and culture, they, they tend you know, to that fit their lives in China uh, girls, you know, would, could, I remember uh, interviewing girls that were third wives, and depending on their mindset, occasion or moments, would dress up as teenager because uh, they want to feel lighthearted and fun and cute. But when they would go for a formal interview, they would use another costume. So they, they really using, uh, for instance, fast fashion or makeup or tutorial that they find on social e-commerce to to experience and to try because 
all of that hasn't been uh, shared by the mother or previous generation. There has been a cut, you know, in the transmission. So they have to use what is as at hand to develop who they are. So brands again play a key role right. to help them become who they are. Okay, um, awesome. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right, so now I will pass my baton on to Tim, Tim Caspers for a second question. Yes, my question uh, was um, considering the recent boycotts of, of Nike and H&M products, um, is this type of instability uh, in the Chinese market something which um, many foreign brands uh, worry about? I guess you, you've already, I asked this question before you talk about this uh, recent uh, development. Yeah, it's, 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 it's extremely worrying uh, and uh, and uh, I had a slide about that, but uh, okay, le le later maybe I can share with you or uh, by other means, but uh, no, it's extremely worrying because, uh, you know, a brand reputation can be killed in a second in China. And, and again, it, now the thing is, which is uh, before it was coming from, from, uh, from the social communities, you know, when again, uh, maybe you remember the campaign by Dolce Cabana, which was extremely stupid. It was sexist and racist. We had this beautiful uh, Chinese uh, Asian model. I don't even know whether she was Chinese and she was uh, eating uh, cannelloni and spaghetti with uh, uh, chopsticks. And of course, uh, she was totally clumsy. And the, the brand was, uh, I mean, the backlash on that brand was amazing. And that was already probably uh, four or five years ago. Uh, but now it, it's still, uh, despite, you know, Dolce and Cabana have the produced video uh, uh, almost crying to, to send excuse to the Chinese society. But I mean, the, the brand is, is really in a bad shape now. Chinese people, again, they they really have this uh, common uh, feeling of having been humiliated by other foreign nations. So it's, it's super sensitive and touchy. But you know, some things I remember, I was working for the brand Delce, the, the luggage brand, and uh, the, the, the marketing team was in Hong Kong and they created uh, our website. You know, you, you could click uh, to find a store uh, in, in your surrounding area. And in Hong Kong, you know, the team was from Hong Kong and the brand has been in Hong Kong for, uh, before uh, Hong Kong was uh, retroceded to China. And they, they so they, they had created a, a country that was Hong Kong just for a convenience reason. You know, you're from Hong Kong, your Delsa luggage is broken. You want to go to the next Delsa store. So you don't click China, of course, you click Hong Kong. But we we had to to stop the website running and we have we had to totally reconfigure it because it was starting to become a big thing in china so but before it was coming from from the ground you know from the from the community of chinese consumer and uh, and but now like the cotton thing is is not really coming from from the community is coming via the government through the Young League Communist Party. And then it goes, in a second, it goes on the social uh, network. And, and there is thousands of examples like that. You, you, you have to be extremely sensitive to the, the symbol and the codes. And, the, and so I do a lot of semiotics also when I run my, my brand project on, on naming, on logo, on on campaign, you know, and, and it, it's very, very complicated. And I also wanted to share with you a few campaigns that have been designed by Louis Vuitton. And actually uh, Louis Vuitton is an, is an old brand trying to reshake and, and make a revolution, you know, to attract younger generation, but they created one campaign that was only targeting the Chinese brand native. And they had a backlash in other Western society because the people were saying like, what, what is Louis Vuitton doing? You know, we just don't understand what is the, the proposition. So it's almost now, and, and what's happening now is that I think brands will have to, to make a, a very complicated choice between China market and China market, meaning China brand native, which are quite specific and the rest of the world. And I don't know how they are going to juggle that. It, it's happening right now. So let's see, you know, how the, the, the Xinjiang cotton scandal will tame down. Uh, but again, the Chinese cotton is, is not, 
coming from the community. And in the meantime, you know, Adidas was in the turmoil also of the Sintian cotton scandal, but it launched a, a new range of uh, sneakers and it, it went through the roof in terms of sales uh, in the same time. So let's see what's happening. But the, the political stance is quite uh, to be monitored by brands for sure. Right. Um, next question by Sandra. Sandra. Or perhaps I can read it out loud if you prefer that. All right, then I will. Um, let me find your question. In terms of uh, Confucius, Confucianism, sorry, uh, is this is it this philosophic system used in any way by companies to force consumers to buy or use their products? Or is it just the inner part of the Chinese lives invisible in terms of higher part hierarchy issues and virtues which should be followed so i guess the question is about yeah confucius and consumer behavior so that, those are the the case study i wanted to share Emily, and and i was sharing you a few uh, uh, food brand campaigns because uh, uh, the cosianism of any society but you know, when you are a brand like Milkana, I was going to share that example. Milkana is a dairy uh, uh, brand. Uh, of course, you know, to, I mean, the, you have to be, um, how to say, authentic with your brand DNA. Yeah? So when you are a, a very old uh, Chinese uh, cooking oil brand, you can definitely, you know, develop a positioning or a proposition or a campaign that will that will build and capitalize on the Confucianism value of, I care for the older generation, I respect the older. So I was going to share with you a, um, a campaign about uh, Chinese New Year time and the, the, the young, uh, I mean, the, the child generation coming back to visit the grandparents and they were bringing as a gift uh, a big bottle of uh, that very traditional uh, sunflower cooking oil because cooking oil is something you know also um, a lot of fried food in in China especially in the north of China so and it's also at, at I mean some times ago you know people could, in China could not afford to buy cooking oil it was very expensive so bringing back the the very nice uh, sunflower cooking oil bottle to your parents when you are again a traditional Chinese brand makes sense because you, you, you really play on the Confucianism code. When you are Milkana, you know, dairy and cheese and you're selling cheese to the Chinese, if you were showing that the same type of proposition campaign it would sound totally odd and not sincere with the type of brand. So Milkana as on the contrary, I would say, develop campaigns where the kids were playing with the food, which is something, you know, Chinese people don't touch the food. They have chopstick. Huh? They, they don't never. And this was an issue also for a fast food like Burger King or McDonald's because that people didn't know how to eat hamburgers. But Milkana was on purpose developing campaign where the kids were playing with the slice of, uh, of cheese. And that's a way to say we are, a model, um, we are breaking the codes with the kids. You know, we play with food. We, uh, the mom was using the, the gruyere with the hole, you know, uh, showing the eyes of the kids. So it, you, you can play with Confucianism value, but on purpose, huh? whether you are in or you're out. But uh, always you have to be sincere with what your brand DNA is all about. And you have to respect no uh, even you are a western brand you on purpose you you don't want to go for the confucianism way or depicting the family eating for instance you you still have to be very cultural blunder you could make so you have to know and then you have to decide whether you go for them or you ignore is it clear okay <laughs> um uh the next question antonino Antonino, or as well, I can read it. No, no, I can read it myself. Please, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for uh, today's webinar. It was really interesting. And my question is, um, 
So Chinese consumers are interested about their environment quality. You mentioned the example of the meat they were buying from France. But uh, from what I've seen in living China, because I've been also living there also during the pandemic, people is increasing the amount of products they want to purchase. And it, isn't it in contradiction with that? Like people buy more, but they are more interested in the environment. So I wanted to ask you this question. Thank you so much. Oh, the, 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 that's a very interesting. I've been working on the organic or bio category. But you know, it drives you crazy in China because uh, when you go to Carrefour, for instance, huh, or Auchan or whatever, and you go to the organic corner and uh, your mango or your carrot that are organic are wrapped into <laughs> several layers of plastic. So I think uh, it's also a question of cycle. Uh, for, for the young generation, uh, you know, the, the, the real raw food that the that would grow in rural area that are less polluted, you know, it's also for them, you know, is, is something they want to come out of, you know, because many of those brand natives, they still have grandparents or uncle or great grandparents even that are living in the, in the tier four city, you know, sometimes in, in little village. And what they, when they think about that, they think of, poverty of, uh, you know, not educated people, not connected with modernity. So there is quite of a, a, a muddy uh, um, connection. Whoops. Oh, I'm sorry. Neighbors. Is... I'm sorry. My neighbors are doing some silly things. Oh. So there is a connection between uh, uh, clean food coming from rural area that are not polluted and the mud aspect. So this is a little bit uh, conflicting in a way. So they care about the environment, but in a very selfish way. Yeah? They want to be able to, to pay and to make sure they get the high quality organic. You know, in, in, in France or in Western countries, you, you know, when you really go, uh, oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's awful. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it never happens. Can't believe that. Um, um, perhaps you can put on your uh, mic, uh, your earphones. Uh, wait. But we can still hear you, no problem. So okay, okay. go on. We can still hear you. I'm sorry. It's amazing. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. So are, are you done with the answer? Okay, no, no, I'm not done. I forgot okay. what I was saying. <laughs> No, I, I want to say is, uh, uh, yeah, people going definitely in a selfish way. They, they are very worried about the food because so many food scandal. They want to be, and, and they know they need to pay uh, high fees to get organic, but they are very worried about the whole logistics. So they, they are going to, to do some uh, totally opposite to environmentally friendly things to be able to eat and drink organic, clean, and, and pure uh, food. So this is not yet in, in a mature, uh, in terms of mindset, it's not very mature. They're not, it's, a, it's, a, it's conflicting. It's, it's not a super clean and authentic, the, the behavior and the attitude versus uh, organic. But it, it's really coming from a big stress uh, deriving from all of the food scandal. It will change uh, over time, but right now we are not in the same cycle, Western culture and Chinese and Chinese culture about uh, environment and organic. They are, they are more interested in, for now, uh, I mean, I'm making something a bit too gen general, but they are more interested into uh, upgrading and materialistic comfort than really thinking about the broader pictures and, and uh, the future. They, they, are, they are trapped into a, a uh, grabbing fast all of the opportunity uh, and trying to save themselves in a way. Thank you. Great, so thank much. you. And <clears throat> oh, yeah. Uh, next question, Teresa. Teresa, or I can read it. Um, I can read it. Thank you. Please. 
<laughs> Hello, first of all, thank you very much for this presentation. It's been so interesting. Um, so my question is, uh, we talked a lot about um, consumer personas and how Generation Z is being very idealistic and seeking individualism. Do you think that this generation will have an especially hard time adjusting to the reality of Chinese society once they've entered this later stage in their life where they have to adjust to working? Um, or do you think they're going to adapt a more pragmatic attitude like the young professionals who are mainly trying to assert their position in society? Yeah, and, and uh, uh, okay, first, uh, Chinese people are extremely agile, pragmatic, and you know, they, they can uh, compare to, I think, to us, huh? Western people, they, they, they are quite used to endure uh, hard, hard times. And that's also part of the Confucianism. You know, you, you are always ready um, with your Confucianist background to sacrifice yourself for your next generation. But this generation, especially the Gen Z and, and even the younger, you know, they were born in and already for uh, talking about tier, tier one, tier two, and maybe tier three cities. For them, you know, the tomorrow would be better, they would be better off tomorrow uh, materialistically than, than the day before, which is different for, for your generation. Huh? Like uh, for us, you know, uh, even me, my generation, and I think yours, you are, you are not so optimistic about the future because especially now with the pandemic, but you know, you have AIDS, uh, you had the uh, pollution, you have the oil uh, prices, you have job market becoming tighter, etc. Our, my parents, they live uh, uh, booming after second world war generation. So right now, the, the optimism is reducing, but we need to always have in mind that Gen Z and millennials, overall, they have seen their life improving year by year, even month by month, sometimes day by day. And they have this idea, as I was saying, that everything is possible, that China is strong, that China is now high-tech na nation, China is now modern nation. So this is what they, they have in front of them. But again, deep down inside, they, they fear that tomorrow, and especially when they start the Gen Z moving to young millennials and moving to uh, older millennials and starting a family, they know life is going to be tough because uh, first, they, the social, there is no social security system. I think China, Chinese people, they have around equivalent of 20 euro per year uh, free, you know, to go to the hosp public hospital. The rest of it, they have to pay for it. Uh, for instance, also, as I was saying, Chinese people live very old. I have a, a colleague of mine, uh, she was a young mother and she, her and her husband, they were only, uh, they're coming from the, the single child uh, generation. Uh, she had a very nice job in France, L'Oréal. She decided to come back to China because she knew she would need to afford and she was saving a lot of money because she was already aware that in 20 years, 30 years, she would, she would need to cope with her husband for uh, the life of four grandparents. Plus, you know, pay for the, the studies, which are very expensive of her little girl. And for instance, I was asking her, uh, she was in the generation, she could have had another child. And she told me, no way. First, I have no time. Second, you know, uh, my body, et cetera, is going to suffer if I have another child. But third, it's going, I, I need to save money to be able in 20 years time to pay for the education of my child and, and to have a big enough apartment, maybe I need to host my, my uh, parents-in-law and my parents. So this generation, when they start becoming young parents, you know, pivotal to the society, they are quite worried about the future. Plus the economy is slowing down now huh? and the, the job market is, is getting tougher and getting promoted, uh, having a pay rise. You know, uh, a few years ago, I was discussing with a friend of mine, she was HR of L'Oréal for Asia. Every year, you have to come with a payroll increase of average 10%, 15%. That's no longer the case. But in the meantime, you know, the, the food, uh, if you want to, uh, we were talking about food, if you want to be extremely sure about the food you, you eat, 
Then you want imported food from Australia, New Zealand, or Europe, or et cetera, no longer from Japan because of Fukushima. But you have to pay yeah, to get your avocado from Mexico, your dairy from France, and, and your milk and your uh, kiwi from New Zealand. So life is, is extremely expensive in China. So this generation is quite worried and they're saving a lot of money. So I, I don't know what's lying ahead, but the the lending of the Gen Z generation, you know, when they stop living in a fantasy uh, a social e-commerce world, I think it's going to be tough. And, and the Chinese government know that. And that's why the, the propaganda and the censorship is getting even more stronger because they really want to control the social uh, uh, turmoil that is uh, around the corner, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, this has been super insightful. Um, we have a next question, which I'll read out loud, is from Lanodi. Uh, which place is there for environmental concerns in consumption in China? Which phase? Which place is there for environmental concerns? Can you repeat? Which place? Like, what? how much does it matter, environmental concerns? Uh, okay. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a deep down inside worry. But it's something I think they put in the back of their mind. They are, as I was also explaining, the Gen Z in particular and young millennials, a little bit less so for the older millennials, they are in the, I want to enjoy the moment now. You know, there was also a, a traditionally Chinese people are really a savvy and frugal people. They have a lot of money yeah, on their bank account because again, they know they don't have social security, retirement, uh, they will have to afford for the rest of their life by themselves and they have to take care about older and younger. Uh, but now there is also a new phenomenon is the young generation, they tend to, to spend more than, than they have on their bank account. So they rely on the, on the parents' fortune. So I think now they, they are quite aware that uh, there, there are some major environmental issue, which by the way, are not uh, exactly uh, and transparently shared on, on, the, on the media, but they put that in the back of their mind to enjoy the moment. And as long as they think they have a way to uh, escape, meaning, you know, again, buying imported food or having some uh, going to the, the gym, you know, to, to keep a, a healthy uh, lifestyle, I think they, they, they think they can overcome the environmental uh, issues and they can pay for air purifier, the latest uh, uh, Swiss brand or Japanese brand, you know. I think via the, the money and, um, and, yeah, and paying uh, to guarantee for themselves within the home, the, the right security, hygiene and safe environment. So that's the strategy. It's a little bit short term, huh? but it will, Again, it will hit them in a harder way uh, sometimes. All right, well, that's the last question I had in store. Um, one small thing for the audience, I kindly, you, I, I kindly ask you all to take the time to fill in the survey questions uh, before the end of this event. And last but not least, I invite you all in to join me in cheering and thanking Marie for the impressive work and presentation and insight. So. I'm cheering on my own probably.